Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 11 from the series on the book of Ephesians is titled Practicing Supreme Loyalty to Christ. It's ready for teaching on September 9. The author is John McVeigh and your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 2. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It's there available for us every day. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us in our understanding. But, Lord, we also need your Holy Spirit to guide us in our daily lives, in our relationships with those we love, with those we meet, with those we work with, with those we study with. Lord, we just pray that our influence may be such that people will say, they must know someone special. And we thank you that we have this opportunity in this lesson to learn about the importance of our loyalty to you and in return your loyalty for us. Lord, this week I'd like to pray for Leone in St. Ketz and Nevis, for Audrey, Edith and Mark who listen regularly, for Jose David in Mexico, for Betty Day in Papua New Guinea, not far from where I live, for Gina Mendoza, for Joanne in Melbourne in Victoria, for Doreen who's asked for prayer for Nathan. Lord, whatever Nathan's need is, we pray that you will satisfy it, that your Holy Spirit will work on his heart and his life. We also pray for Yasmin in Colombia, for Amelia in St. Croix, and for Norla in Dominica. Lord, wherever people are listening around the world, we pray that this week, as we open your word, we may be blessed. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And our memory text this week comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. And I have something different for you. While I was at a uh, camp meeting called Grey Nomads in uh, Australia, I asked two of the attendees to read this week's memory verse for us. The first is Heidi Min from the Mitchelton Church in Queensland. Thank you, Heidi. And, Master, treat your slave in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Ephesians 6 verse 9 from the NIV. And then Pastor Andrew Kingston from the Kempsey Church, which was not far from the camp meeting. Thank you, Pastor Andrew. And the memory text today is from Ephesians 6 verse 9. And I'm reading from the New International Version and it says this. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. In 2018, an artefact at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. attracted much attention. It was an abridged Bible designed to teach essentials of faith while deleting any passage inciting rebellion by slaves. Published in 1808, the text does not just remove a passage here or there. 90% of the Old Testament is missing and 50% of the New. Of the 1,189 chapters in the Bible, only 232 remain. Passages seeming to reinforce the evils of slavery, especially in the absence of so much of the Bible's narrative of good news, are left fully intact, including such oft-misused texts as Ephesians 6.5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Today, in our time and culture, our important challenge is to read Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 9 in the context of the full story of salvation, as is revealed in the complete Bible. What can we learn as we watch Paul apply the values of the gospel to the flawed social structures of his day? (music) 
Sunday, September 3. Advice to Children What advice does Paul give to children? And how does he support that counsel from the Old Testament? We're going to read Ephesians 6, 1-3, and we'll also look at passages in Matthew and Mark. First of all, Ephesians 6, 1-3, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And we'll compare that with Matthew 18, verses 1 to 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you were converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. And Matthew 18, verse 10, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father, who is in heaven. And Mark 10, beginning at verse 13, Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. To appreciate fully Paul's counsel to children, we must imagine it being read out in the house churches of the thriving metropolis of Ephesus. The word children, Greek tartekna, could refer to a wide range of ages, since children remained under father's authority until the father was 60 in the Greek tradition or until his death in the Roman one. These children, though, are young enough to be under parental training, as we read in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 6, but old enough themselves to be disciples in their own right. We hear Paul appealing to children who were worshipping in Christian congregations to obey and honour their parents in the Lord, that is, in Christ. And let's compare that with a couple of other texts in Ephesians 5, 22, and Ephesians 6, verses 4, 5, 7, 8, and 9. Ephesians 5, 22 reads, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And Ephesians 6, verses 4 and 5 reads, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord, Bond servants to be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. And verses 7 to 9. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. We are invited here to respect children as themselves being disciples of Christ and to include them as active participants in worship. This makes the passage a foundational one for parenting and for ministry to children. Paul's command to obey is not absolute. When the command of parents, as Ellen White writes in Adventist Home, page 293, contradicts the requirements of Christ, then, painful though it may be, they, that's the children, must obey God and trust the consequences with him. End of quote. Paul completes his exhortation to children by quoting the fifth commandment, bearing witness to the high value he places on the ten commandments as a source of guidance for Christian believers. 
an obvious feature of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 right through to chapter 6 verse 9, and especially in chapter 4 verses 25 and 28 and chapter 5 verses 3 to 14. He begins the quotation, Honour your father and mother in Ephesians 6 verse 2, breaks into it with an editorial comment, which is the first commandment with promise, and then completes the citation, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth, in verse 3. The fifth commandment bears witness that honouring parents is part of God's design for human beings to thrive. Respect for parents, imperfect though they may be, will help foster health and well-being. And so to finish today, how do these verses reinforce how important family relationships are? Monday, September 4. Advice to Parents Compare Ephesians 6 verse 4 and Colossians 3.21. What motivation does Colossians 3.21 provide for avoiding irritating one's children? Ephesians 6 verse 4, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And Colossians 3.21, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Sirach, a Jewish document available in Paul's day, advises fathers about the treatment of their sons. It goes like this in verse 1, He who loves his son will whip him often. Pamper a child and he will terrorize you, in verse 9. Play with him and he will grieve you, and in verse 13. Discipline your son and make his yoke heavy, so that you may not be offended by his shamelessness. End of quote. Paul's counsel bears a very different tone. He first advises a negative command to fathers. Do not provoke your children to anger. Followed by a positive one. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 6. In Paul's day, fathers had complete legal power over their children, who were regarded as his property. Fathers had the right to inflict violent punishment, even death on their children. Indeed, in some respects, a father's power over his children exceeded a master's authority over his slaves. Paul is not endorsing such power, but is boldly clarifying and reshaping family relationships. In the context of a supreme loyalty to Christ, Paul invites Christian fathers to rethink their use of power since children who are provoked to anger will not be well positioned to accept, as it says in Ephesians 6.4, the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Fathers and mothers, Ellen White writes in Child Guidance, page 259, in the home you are to represent God's disposition. You are to require obedience, not with a storm of words, but in a kind, loving manner. Be pleasant in the home. Restrain every word that would arouse unholy temper. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath is a divine injunction. No license is given in God's word for parental severity or oppression or for filial disobedience. The law of God in the home life and in the government of nations flows from a heart of infinite love. End of quote. And so to finish today. Though the context of the lesson here deals with parents and children, what principles can be taken from these texts that should impact how we should deal with all other people? Tuesday, September 5. Slavery in Paul's Day. Read through the counsel to slaves and slave masters in the following passages. Ephesians 6, 5-9, Colossians 3, 22-4, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 7, 20-24, 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2, 1 Peter 2, 18-25. How would you summarize this advice? Well, let's start with the first one, Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 5. 
bondservants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleases, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good any one does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters, do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. And then Colossians 3, beginning at verse 22. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning at verse 20. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. And First Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, Let as many bondservants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honour, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather serve them, because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. And First Peter chapter 2, verse 18 onwards. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable, if, because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps." who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness." by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. It is startling to hear Paul address Christian slave masters and to imagine Christian slaves and their Christian slave master seated together in the house churches of Ephesus. Slavery in the Greco-Roman world could differ from the later version in the New World in significant ways. It was not focused on a single ethnic group. Urban household slaves were sometimes offered opportunities for education and could work as architects, physicians and philosophers. Freedom sometimes occurred for these household slaves after a limited period of service, though most slaves never gained their freedom. In an attempt to acknowledge such differences, a number of recent Bible versions translate the Greek term doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S, or slave, in Ephesians 6, 5-8, as bondservant. Regardless, slavery at any time, in any culture, in any circumstances, is an inexcusable evil, 
and God will judge and condemn slaveholders according to his infinite justice. And for that, we can be thankful. The cry of ex-slave Publius Cyrus is haunting. He writes, It is beautiful to die instead of being degraded as a slave. Given the full range of these realities, the translation of doulos as slave is to be preferred, as in the NIV and the NRSV, especially since these slaves are living under the threat of their masters, as we read in verse 9 of Ephesians verse chapter 6. Slavery was an ever-present evil in Paul's world. He addresses it not as a social reformer, but as a pastor who advises believers how to deal with current realities and to cast a new vision centred on the transformation of the individual believer, which later could have wider implications for society at large. Scott McKnight writes in the letter to Philemon, pages 10 and 11, his vision was not for manumission of slaves in the Roman Empire. Rather, his view was about something other than legal manumission, that is, a new creation, sibling-based fellowship on the basis of adoption as children of God. For Paul, the social revolution was to occur in the church, in the body of Christ, at the local level, and in the Christian house, church, and household. End of quote. And so to finish today, one of the great stains on Christian history is how some use these biblical passages about slavery to justify this evil. What frightening message should we take away about how carefully we need to handle the Word of God? Wednesday, September 6. Slaves of Christ. What does Paul require of Christian slaves in his detailed instructions to them in Ephesians 6, verses 5 to 8? Let's begin at verse 5. Bondservants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleases, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Paul asks Christian slaves to obey their masters, offering heartfelt, excellent service. What is notable is his repeated reference to a grand substitution that he asks them to make. They are not to place their slave master in the place of Christ, offering to him the allegiance that belongs only to Christ. Rather, in the commitments and allegiance that motivate their heartfelt excellent service, they are to substitute Christ the Lord for the slave master. In encouraging this essential substitution, Paul is offering a transformed Christian understanding of the master-slave relationship. Notice the several ways Paul presses this substitution upon them. 1. Their slave masters are diminished by Paul as their earthly masters, pointing toward the real and heavenly master in verse 5. 2. They are to serve with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would Christ in verse 5. 3. Paul notes this substitution most clearly in arguing that Christian slaves are to offer genuine service as slaves, not of their masters, but as slaves of Christ, in verse 6. And 4. In performing their service, they are to do the will of God from the heart, offering heartfelt service directed to God, again in verse 6. And number 5. Paul invites positively motivated service offered as to the Lord and not to man, in verse 7. For their heartfelt service, Christian slaves may expect full reward from Christ when he returns. They have done their work for him and may expect reward from him. 
and especially attractive idea for those trapped in this horrific institution. A slave might feel unappreciated or worse by an earthly master, as we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. But what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. The believing slave, though, has a master who is attentive, noticing whatever good thing each one does, in verse 8 in the New American Standard Bible translation, and offering sure reward. And so to finish today, however much we might wish that Scripture had openly condemned this horrible practice, it doesn't. Nevertheless, what principles can we draw from Paul's words in this context about how we relate to people we work with in our own context? Thursday, September 7, Masters Who Are Slaves In Paul's final words to slaves, whether he is a slave or free, as it says in verse 8 of chapter 6, the word free refers to slave masters, allowing Paul to transition to his counsel to them while imagining slaves and slave masters standing on an equal footing before Christ in the judgment. And we've got some texts to look at here. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And Colossians chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Assuming that you are a Christian slave master who is listening to Ephesians being read out in your house church, how might you react to this counsel offered in the presence of your slaves? Ephesians 6 and verse 9, And you masters, do the same things to them. Give up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Paul addresses masters, slave masters, in a pointed exhortation which turns on the sharp contrast between the lords, in the Greek hoi kuroioi, translated as masters, who have a habit of threatening their slaves, and the Lord, ho kurios, Christ, with whom there is no partiality. Paul asks masters to do the same to them, the slaves, which would have been shocking to a first-century slave owner. Masters should respond to their slaves with deeds of goodwill governed by their allegiance to Christ, corresponding to what Paul has just asked of slaves in Ephesians 6, 5-8. He tells them to stop threatening their slaves, a common practice of a time in which Masters administered a wide variety of punishments, including beating, as we read in 1 Peter 2.20. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. And also sexual abuse, being sold and parted from loved ones, extreme labour, starvation, shackles, branding, and even death. For this they will be judged by God. Paul supports his command with two motivations that call slave masters to look beyond the social structures of the Greco-Roman world. One, they and their presumed slaves are co-slaves of a single master, knowing that He who is both your master and yours is in heaven, we read in the ESV. And we compare that with Colossians chapter 4 and verse 1. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And two, 
The Heavenly Master judges all without partiality, since their own Master treats those regarded as slaves on an equal footing with others, so should they. And we look at Philemon verses 15 and 16. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Much of Paul's language in Ephesians would be especially heartening for Christian slaves. Adoption as sons, we read about in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Redemption in verse 5, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Inheritance in verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. And then being enthroned with Jesus in chapter 2, verse 6, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, becoming fellow citizens, members of the household of God in Ephesians 2 and verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of of God. And we compare that with Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, and integral parts of the body of Christ, as we see in Ephesians 3, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, and Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 16. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Ephesians 6, 5-9 activates all the teaching in the letter as operative in the relationships between slaves and slave masters, including the counsel about speech in chapter 4 and sexual ethics in Ephesians 5, 1-2.
to 14. In Ephesians 4, 25 to 32, we read, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labour, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And Ephesians 5, 1 to 14. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God." Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Friday, September 8. Paul's respect for children as fellow believers in Ephesians 6, 1-3 heightens our concern for the ways in which children are treated in our world today. His word to fathers in Ephesians 6, verse 4 invites us to consider parental responsibilities. Applying Paul's counsel to slaves in verses 5-8 to and especially his counsel to slave masters in verse 9 is more challenging, since the social setting is distant for many of us and because we know that slavery, in any form, is one of the greatest of moral evils. Still, since these words are inspired ones that are part of Scripture, we should ponder how to apply them today. With the believers in Ephesus in the first century, we have the privilege and responsibility of applying the values of the gospel to our relationships. The discussion questions below are designed to foster that important work, and there are five discussion questions. 1. What does it mean for Adventists that love for children is identified as evidence of a people prepared for the Lord in Luke 1.17? He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And he's quoting here from Malachi 4 verse 6. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. 2. Paul's obvious respect for children suggests a searching question. What is our responsibility to extend the care of Christ to children who have experienced violence, sexual abuse and shame in their early lives? In view of research on the profound impact of adverse childhood experiences, what is our responsibility toward them? 
Three, as an extension of Paul's respect for children and Jesus' care for them, what responsibilities does the church have to nurture and protect the children in its care? What systems and procedures need to be in place to do so? Four, Paul's counsel to slaves and slave masters in Ephesians 6, 5-9 is often applied to the relationships between employees and employers. In what ways might this be appropriate? Let's read it. Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 5. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service, as men pleases, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. And you masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. What dangers present themselves in doing so? And five... Slavery remains a painful reality in our world, with more than 40 million people enslaved, according to the Global Slavery Index. As free people whose spiritual forebears were firmly committed to the abolition of slavery, what are our responsibility to these enslaved sons and daughters of God as we sing of Christ from that famous carol, O Holy Night? Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. A Book and a Ride by Andrew McChesney Alexei Arishanyan, a 33-year-old Ukrainian living in Poland, was running late. He had just finished his work installing windows and had to stop at the gas station as he raced to meet his wife for an evening shopping trip. At the gas pump, Alexei noticed a young man trying to start his scooter. He kept trying to start the scooter but to no avail. A large insulated bag on the back of his scooter showed that he was making a food delivery. Alexei didn't speak good Polish, but he didn't want to pass up an opportunity to help. He thought about the young man as he filled up the tank and paid for the gas. Back in the car, he opened the window and called out, What's wrong? The young man was Polish. He said, The scooter doesn't want to start. Alexei belongs to a group of church members who distribute Ellen White's The Great Controversy. It is a difficult task with few receptive people, and he saw an opportunity. He handed the young man a book. I have a gift for you, he said. It's a Christian book that contains the history of Christianity from the first Christians who defended the truth after Christ returned to heaven to the events that will occur at the end of the world. I think that you will find it interesting. The young man accepted the book and thanked him. Alexei returned to his car and sat and thought, I can't leave. I haven't done my duty as a Christian, he thought. I gave him a book, but I didn't fill his need. Opening the car door, he said, I can take you to your delivery place. Really? the young man asked with surprise. Really? Alexei said. I understand how you feel. I'll take you. The young man grabbed the bag of food and Alexei drove him about two miles or three kilometres to the address. Will you wait for me? the young man asked. Of course, I bought you. On the way back to the gas station, the young man marvelled at Alexei's kindness. In Poland, very few Christians stop and offer help. But you are a Ukrainian Christian and offered help, he said. He introduced himself as Camille. Alexei spoke about the love of God and Camille listened intently. As they arrived at the gas station, a co-worker from Camille's workplace pulled up to fix the scooter. Alexei left. Camille had helped and he could leave. Alexei was late to his appointment to meet his wife, but it was worth it. He had been delayed by a divine appointment.
This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will go to the Trans-European Division, which includes Poland. Thank you for planning a generous offering. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as eyes for the visually impaired through Christian services for the blind in Australia and New Zealand, it became a podcast in July 2007 and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favorite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, remember, God is always faithful.